Thank you for joining us today. This is part of the Crisis Coach webinar series that is presented in conjunction with our good friends at RenWeb. We in invite you to become our friend at Facebook. Firestorm Solutions is our Facebook account. And you can follow us on Twitter at Firestorm Soul. There is a hashtag for this session. That hashtag is Crisis Coach. Firestorm transforms crisis into value and empowers you to manage risks and crises. Firestorm expertise is crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communication, crisis public relations, and consequence management. Please keep in mind that the presentation today is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion, and the content should be discussed with your organization's personal counsel. And this information should not be interpreted as legal advice or legal opinion. Our good friends at RenWeb are the co-sponsor and host of this particular webinar series. This is the Crisis Coach webinar series. Today we're discussing school violence prevention. Our presenter today is Jim Satterfield, president of Firestorm, and he will be uh, with us in a moment. Uh, we keep looking for uh, for Jacqueline Day, who is the host. I know she had some problems logging in. Um, Jim, do you want to give the commercial for Jacqueline? Well, I, I don't know that I'll give a commercial for Jacqueline, but I certainly will say some nice things about uh, RenWeb and uh, Jacqueline and uh, all the services that they provide to our schools. And I think we're all very fortunate to have a company like RenWeb that uh, provides the software that runs our schools today and helps us better understand uh, what we're looking for uh, for our students. And I think it ties in with our topic today. RenWeb has been a the underwriter of this Crisis Coach webinar series now for a couple of years. And uh, we will be coming up to their user conference this summer. And for those of you who have never attended a user conference, it's a great opportunity to network. And there will be a series of workshops there around crisis management, and we'll do a, an exercise of making decisions in a crisis and a chance to better learn what goes through and, and happens within a company. Bill, if, uh, if Jacqueline is able to log in in a few minutes, if you'll just interrupt me and tell me that she's here, we'll stop and, and let her provide her additional comments about activities that are coming up with RenWeb for all of our schools. So as we continue on today, I'm Jim Satterfield. I'm the president of Firestorm, and I'm certainly glad to have you all here with us today. We've done a survey of some 400 schools, and I thought you might find it interesting to hear some of the insights that we learned in that. 58% of the schools reported that their plans were, quote, a work in progress. 18% said that they were completely prepared, which would mean to me that 82% are not completely prepared. And and certainly would be an exposure. 44% said they were not sure if their schools even had the plans. That is a little scary when you think about it. And 38% responded that they needed help in the area. 55% of the schools reported they needed guidance with crisis plans, tools, and training. And I think that's part of the reason why RenWeb is underwriting this webinar series and the workshops at the user meeting uh, at the user conference so that you can have a chance to experience uh, what you need to know in order to make better plans. But if you look at the little uh, pie chart over to the right of, in the bottom of the screen, do you feel confident that your organization is prepared to respond to an incident of violence? A third said yes. Two thirds, 28% uh, said no, and 39% said that they didn't know. Well, if you don't know, then they obviously you it's more of a no category. As you think about this, this is a fairly uh, significant concern when we think about the violence and the stories that we see on a regular basis around violence in our schools. And it's in private schools, independent schools, religious schools, and public schools in the market today. So hopefully today those that answered uh, no will have some idea of what they might need to start with or those that aren't sure similarly, or maybe even some of the yeses might find some opportunity to improve uh, what they're doing today. 
as we look at it, the goal is not to be unprepared, it's to be prepared. Uh, the percentages of the previous survey certainly indicated that we have a large percent that are in fact not prepared today. And there are some challenges for protecting our students. Uh, when uh, parents deliver their children to your school and you're responsible for the care, custody, and control during that period of time, there's certainly an expectation that this is going to turn out well. Now, it, when we look at things that are going on today, and many times we say, well, that's not going to happen in my school. That's a public school issue. That's a, an issue for someone else. Uh, and I'm reminded of two or three things that we've experienced just within recent weeks in helping private religious schools, uh, independent religious schools, to deal with some of the issues that are going on. We uh, have worked with a school where they had bullying that was going on within the school, and one of the sports teams had developed a habit of where the students on the team were disciplining other students. That's a very scary area, and the coaches and the leadership of the school were unaware, and as this thing continued to develop and through a later investigation, it was found out that this had been going on for years within the school, unaware of the school leadership. And what happened in this particular area that the younger student was held down by two older students where a third proceeded to uh, attack him, and a fourth videotaped it on an iPad and the rest of the team stood around and watched and observed. Now, the, there are many areas of concern when you think about that particular event, that uh, action could rise to that level, that it could go unrecognized for a long period of time, and that none of the team members reported that into the school. But when the young man went home and told his parents, you can imagine uh, they were not pleased. Uh, and when you spend thousands and thousands of dollars, you, you don't expect your child to experience those types of events and coming together. And so clearly it had an impact on the young man. It had a, an impact on the boys that were suspended or expelled and for the team where the season was canceled as a result of this. This just happened. It happened at a Christian school. It can happen at your school. And so one of the things that we want to talk about today is becoming aware of these things before they occur, to look at what the warning signs and signals are that you need to become involved, because it's, it's an opportunity now of dealing with it now or never, and we would much rather deal with it before the student is pushed into the locker or the violence starts to occur. We had another religious school where they found one of their uh, staff had been arrested at home by the police for downloading child pornography. We live in a world today that's vastly different than the world that we grew up in. And to look at those aspects of it uh, certainly are a concern. And then I, I spoke last week at the International Crisis and Risk Communications Conference. And it's a great opportunity because it brings together uh, academics and researchers and practitioners in dealing around crisis management and how we communicate. And one of the, uh, the people at the conference is uh, was sharing that his wife was the librarian at uh, Sandy Hook and described in great detail the events and how they unfolded during the day to give an insight there. And one of the things that happened, his wife, as soon as we became aware, got the students that were in the library into a storage closet, blocked the door, put chairs against mm -hmm. the door to protect them, and her, her students escaped fine. Uh, in that process. Bill, I think I hear your mic there. Or Jacqueline, is that you? So we're picking up some extra uh, uh, sounds, Bill. And as we continued on, we um, she locked the doors and her students were safe. And as you know, at Sandy Hook, many students were in fact not safe. And, and mm -hmm. that orientation presented a, a significant problem. So we want to talk about these things now before they become to those acts where you have to look at it. By the way, the national standards and best practices are that you lock classroom doors from the inside and they remain locked during the while the class is in session, again creating a barrier in that way. Now we're concerned not only about mm -hmm. the bullies and the people that bring the violence, but those that are bullied 
because look at that statistic. 78% of school shooters felt bullied, persecuted, or threatened by others. And that's an area that we want to address as we come together. So as we think about these things today, if, can you identify your school's next crisis? It's not important that we can. It's more important that you can. And today we're going to be talking about what it's going to take to create that type of a predictive, actionable, intelligence system within your organization. So when you think about an intelligence network, there are a variety of components. And we've talked about some of these over this um, quarter as we've discussed it. The anonymous reporting, uh, we did a webinar on that. You can go back and talk about how you create that culture within your school. Background checks, and we'll mention that again briefly today. We've done one around behavioral risk threat assessment. And I'll give you some of those highlights today, but we really want to focus on social media monitoring, social media risk monitoring, and looking in that direction. Now, the standards for background checks are that, obviously, you need to do them annually. Uh, most schools are doing background checks upon hiring, but if you're hiring coaches or teachers or staff, you, you know, or even volunteers that are coming in to help, you need to look at those backgrounds, not only the, the year that you hire them, but each following year because new information can come up and you would want to be aware. Parents or students are expecting you to know who you have in these positions of authority. Now, you are doing federal felony background searches, and that's great, and I would strongly encourage you to continue to do so. And that gives you information when someone has been arrested and convicted, emphasis on the word convicted, of a felony. But if someone was arrested for a felony and plea bargained it down to a misdemeanor, they're not going to be involved in that national felony background search. You're not going to get that information. So if they were arrested for child molestation but plea bargained it down to a misdemeanor level because of evidence or other factors, you would never find that in your national background search. The only way you would find that is by looking at the county courthouse level in that county search. The good news is that firms that do the background checks generally in, can include the county level. It's not a large additional expense. It's certainly worth it. And the other emphasis here to do it monthly is that if you had a teacher who was arrested for drunk driving or any other confrontational issue, you would want to know that and it is expected that you would know it. So creating your intelligence network is to understand who are you bringing into your school. And I know you knew last year, but now this year, have you updated that information to be prepared? Now, the warning signs are there. There are warning signals of these types of areas, and we've talked about those, and we will continue to do so today. And so the idea here is to know before that gun comes to school before it's in a backpack and enters into your school there. And we'll focus on behavioral risk threat assessment. And that's a program that we've talked about previously, but I want to hit a couple of highlights to emphasize, because as we go into looking at creating the intelligence network and the monitoring, these same behaviors of concern we'll see exemplified in the world of social media. So as we look at a behavioral risk threat assessment, those things that are just minor infractions, the, the pranks, the issues that are around, you have a normal discipline program in your school and that's working very well and you're handling those areas. If you go all the way to that high that's shown there and it's an act of violence, a gun coming to school, you or a threat that's made particularly, you'll be calling 911 involving the authorities. You'll have to report it to the Department of Child and Family Services. Uh, those aspects, I think, all of our schools are generally doing well at the extreme, the very minor and the very major as we come together. But it's that gray area in the middle, the behaviors of concern, that we're going to focus on just briefly here as we move forward. We want you to look at being able to divide that into three levels, guarded, elevated, and severe. And how you go through the screening will help you determine Obviously, those things that are at the lower end, guarded, not much worse than the normal discipline, but yet there needs to be a follow-up, a monitoring, and an action plan. Those that rise all the way up to severe, then we probably will be moving that subject of interest 
that person of interest, that student or faculty member out of the school until we can know that they're no longer a potential threat associated with it. So in the, to the side where you see behaviors of concern, threatening behavior, physical injury, and death, our goal is for intervention at the behaviors of concern, the recognition, the identification, and action there, and not letting it rise to the level of the threat or the injury or the death. As we carry this forward, this means that there has to be a comprehensive program within your school uh, established so that everyone knows what to be looking for, ways that they can report it, policies and procedures to deal with these types of matters, and the consistency of doing the same approach each and every time there's been an identified behavior of concern. Now the behavioral screening, and you see the beginning of the listing of the deep kinds of details that you would need here. Yeah, obviously if you've identified a behavior of concern, you would assemble your behavioral assessment team. We recommend that that's a minimum of three people, preferably no more than five. You would want to have someone from your counseling office, uh, someone representing maybe the athletic side, uh, someone... And it, you're looking to be able to deal with those types of behaviors that are needed here uh, and looking into each of those areas. And so how you conduct that uh, interview with the subject, the parents, the teachers, the classmates who have seen these types of areas, obviously suicide and risk assessment uh, would still be another element that we would be looking into it. Holding the uh, meeting to analyze the data collected. Uh, completing the screening reports, and we'll talk about that in coming together. The action plan may mean a referral outside of the school to a third party to do a mental health evaluation and determination of coming back in. As we look at the three levels that we mentioned earlier, you start to see how we take that middle area, not the low, not the high, but the middle, dividing it into these three specific areas, the guarded risk level, there's some supervision required, some intervention that you would take place. And this just a little bit more, but we want to make sure that we can catch this problem now. And if we intervene and find that there's a behavior of concern in the eighth grade, we follow that student for the eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth grades. We're seeing these some of these behaviors occurring in the lower level schools, and that's an area that you will want to then follow them for the rest of their career uh, at your school. The elevated, we have more enhanced supervision, a closer following and intervention following the screening that's been done. And finally, at the severe level, there's not been a violent act yet, but there are indications here that violence would be clearly done. We'd have a written action plan, monitoring, we'd remove the student or the subject until we are confident that they no longer pose a threat to themselves or others. This is the area where you want to make sure that you're doing exactly the same thing every time as those elements come in place. So establishing a program means putting all of these elements there. How are you going to do the investigation, the monitoring? What are the forms and processes that you would follow? Identifying and training that behavioral assessment team so that they're ready to carry that forward and coordination both with the board and your outside legal counsel. The screening tools, there are a variety of tools out there. They all are good. They all have value. Uh, in fact, you can even follow the Secret Service or the FBI protocols that are available. You can have access to those at no cost, which is, uh, certainly fits into most schools' budgets as you carry forward. But the other tools have value as you carry that one uh, together. You would want to look at then how you would convene and notify the team and how you would develop the corrective action plan. And the action plan is designed to help that student to recover to a point that they no longer pose a risk to themselves or others, and you will have to share that with the person's teachers, with the coaches, with the people that would interact directly with them to understand so that we can monitor and follow that process. The four levels in building that type of a program are one is the awareness, uh, making sure that everyone in the school recognizes those, those behaviors of concern. Many times students may be the first that can see it and, and understand it, but you have to have a way for them to be able to report it anonymously. 
and to share that information. It's not a matter of telling, it's a matter of sharing. And if you want to hear more about anonymous reporting, go back and uh, listen to the webinar around anonymous reporting and what's involved. There has to be a central repository within your school. These could be paper files, electronic files, so that you're keeping all of these observations and all of this information together at one point in time so that you don't have to uh, worry about uh, what's being said that might be missed by someone else. And so creating that allows us nothing to fall through the crack because many times after these events we find that someone had seen something, someone had heard something, and that information got lost. And then finally the plan itself, how we conduct the uh, the investigation, the screening that we've been talking about, the action plans, the monitoring, the sign-off and record keeping. All of those elements must be included in order to have a program in place. Now, the behaviors of concern that you've seen us uh, and heard us talk about, some of these are minor, but when they rise to that area where it's red, imminent warning uh, signs, now we're afraid of the escalation and starting to see some of those elements in coming. Now, just because uh, someone has some social withdrawal doesn't necessarily mean that they're a problem. What we're looking for are multiples of these uh, behaviors of concern and intervening at that point in time before they escalate up to where an act of violence or threat must come together. Similarly with suicide, knowing what the warning signs are and sharing that so that intervention can happen early. Suicide also brings a, a significant additional risk, not only to the student who's contemplating suicide or has thought about it or talked about it. We see that in many of these cases, was we're dealing in schools, we yeah. worked with a school last year uh, where there was a student who had uh, threatened suicide, found that there was a kill list. And almost uh, the majority of the time, you will find that there is a kill list associated with someone who's contemplating suicide. It's a chance for them to quote even the score, end quote, and they would carry that forward and carry that action out. So I would encourage you to make sure that you're aware that you have programs in place to be able to deal with those issues. So we're following a predict, plan, perform process, understanding what the vulnerabilities and threats are, what are their impacts, what are the triggers, and how do you monitor them. That's the fundamental building block for having a plan for violence prevention within your school. When we talk about the impacts and the consequences here, they go beyond the individual children that are involved. They can relate to the financial position of the school, the brand, and the reputation. One of the school that I was describing to you earlier who had the, the bullying and the violence attacks from the sports team on the young man is experiencing a decline in enrollment. Uh, their renewals uh, for the fall term are off, off significantly, and this episode is being exemplified of that. Now, while the enrollment remains strong in the middle school and the upper school, the lower school enrollment is down considerably. And it's think about it, parents are not wanting their children to continue to move up and move into that type of an environment. And when you're paid thousands of dollars a year, this is, again, not the expectation. But if you lose a student in the first or second grade and don't have them for the third, the fourth, the fifth, all the way up to the twelfth, you're talking about an impact of a six figures associated with that loss of that single student over the life of their term with your school. If you suddenly are losing 100 students, now you're talking about a seven figure impact. Uh, a 10 students, a seven figure figure impact. If you lose 100, it's an eight-figure impact. So the financial ramifications around violence or threats and behaviors of concern are significant, not only to the individuals involved, but into the stability from a financial perspective of your school. So we want to be aware of it. We want your board aware of it. And we want you to have a program in place to have an intelligence network to identify these behaviors as early as possible before they can escalate. And so that's where the planning comes in. And then finally in the performing, the training, the exercising of your plans and doing the monitoring as we go forward. But let's now talk about creating this intelligence network. And you're going to hear us talk about listen and look a lot. Listening is where we are 
aggregating all the conversations that are going on out there. And it provides us with a situational awareness of what's occurring within your school community. We look at streams of conversations. We look at phrases and words to create this general awareness. And once we find something of concern, then we can look specifically at that person. We can look at their sphere of influence, who they're talking with. Um, we can then look at that person not only now, but what they had said previously in that area. And we can do it on a geocoding basis. We can put up a geofence, like in your uh, navigation system in your car to figure out where you're going. We can build it something around your school and look at the communications that are coming in and out via social media. But we can have the broader listening that picks it up wherever it's concerned. But I want to step you through why this is important and what the implications are around it. So when we think about social media, it's not random, it's targeted. And one of our goals here is then to identify who the target or what the target is in this conversational universe that's going on out there. There are billions of postings every single day. And um, you probably didn't grow up in that environment where that's what the norm is. But today, if you go to dinner with teenagers, they're going to be using their smartphones and texting back and forth and communicating directly and not even speaking out loud. But those conversations, all the conversations that are occurring today are very targeted. They're targeted toward your school or an event or a student or a faculty member within your school. And if you knew about it, then you could make more effective decisions. And that's the value of creating this intelligence network. Look at the postings. I told you guys earlier she said she was going to kill herself, but all I did was tell you guys that she was lying. I never told her to kill herself after a suicide. Look at how many times this was retweeted in the school. Look at the number of people that marked this as a favorite posting. If you had known that this a student was contemplating uh, suicide in your school, you would have intervened. That information is knowledge is available to you now, and it's available to you on social media as we go forward. Now, when people know something, they talk about it. And when they talk, they're talking today on social media. This is an important concept that we want to make sure that as you're talking to the rest of the team in your school, that they're understanding what's going on. And so when you look at that, you can then see that the world has changed considerably. Uh, the statistics are that if someone's thinking about a violent act, 80% of the time, someone else knows. And 67% of the time, two-thirds of the time, two or more people know. And when they know, they talk about it. And that's why, and they're talking on social media. Look at the postings. You said that you were going to shoot up the school. You, oh, yeah, laugh out loud, yeah, but it really wasn't going to shoot up the school. I'm not even white. Um, look down. So what about another Twitter you ha had or not? Another Twitter account is the reference. Yeah, because I had use another account to say I wouldn't get caught, but still they did. I don't even know how they did that. This information and conversation is going on. So if a student was saying they were going to shoot up the school, you would want to know that and know about it within your school. So the words matter, and importantly, the intent matters. And that's why we're looking at this and trying to focus on what uh, predictable intelligence there is out there. Knowing and seeing this posting, say more one thing about my brother and I'm going to kill you. Wouldn't you want to know that something was being said in your school about another student and that the student's brother had to come forward to defend it? So potentially now we're going to have a confrontation in our school. This is the type of information that you should know and can know and are expected to know. Uh, our EVP for uh, intelligence in this area. Our chief intelligence analyst, Karen Mazzullo, monitors terms and uses and phrases. And she found a school with a picture of a student in a classroom holding a gun and a number of students around them. And the picture disturbed her greatly. So she did some further research and figured out it was a math class, actually calculus, then figured a teacher's name, and then was able to trace that teacher uh, back to 
a specific school in Myrtle Beach. She contacted the head of school and said, I, I don't know if this is a real picture or a phony one or made up, but it bothered me and I wanted you to know. And he researched and in fact dealt with it and dealt with those issues. And the head of school came back and said that one of the things that bothered him the most was this school, um, 35 students had shared that picture and not one of them had come forward. So this knowledge and information is out there. Two days later, the head of school got a call from a parent who saw the posting on their child's computer and said, did you know about this? What are you doing about it? And he goes, yes, we knew about it. Yes, we've handled it. And it puts him in a completely different position. This is the world that we're in today. The social conversation is a very complex one. And it involves semantics of speech, syntax, context, and idiom. How we talk about things is different today. Uh, Glock can be, is a gun, and it didn't say the word gun. So you have to understand what's being selected to understand what all of these words mean in coming together and focusing on it. I think it's a great opportunity for someone with an English degree to come in and start to help us as we analyze and understand. So listen is a, com is a complex thing. We're looking at patterns of conversation, mm -hmm. and we're looking at those patterns in a constructed, investigative manner, manner, where they occur and when they occur. That, if something's going on on Instagram, you've got to look there. If something's occurring on uh, some other platform, you need to go there and look, and you will be able to tell just as it's starting to develop. Now, as you see the postings here, uh, who, who brought a gun to school? Somebody brought a gun to school? Did somebody say they weren't going to tell you guys somebody brought a gun to school? Okay, I'm glad I'm graduating this year. This is a conversation that went on, and you can start to see how one thing builds to another. And once a person starts to share these comments, they come through a wider and wider string, and more and more people know about it. Uh, yeah, everyone is fine because they caught whoever planned it. Uh, there was almost a shooting earlier at my school. And I apologize, by the way, for the language, but these are the way the, the uh, postings are coming. And you see this from early March. This type of information is out there. And the type of attitude and direction about what was happening. This guy got mad at his friends because they were making fun of him. And he got mad and brought a gun to school. That's what we want to know about. Now, our students are out. Many of them uh, have part-time jobs, maybe in fast food or another franchise opportunity. We see this impact because we're looking. She hit the blunt. Would you want to know that one of your students was smoking marijuana and carrying forward? And you see another picture here. You don't have until tomorrow what's on social media today is already in your school. It's already in your organization as you're coming forward. And you can see it's even spread to others within it. So it's not a McDonald's problem. It's a school problem. It's a problem that comes back and relates to who we are and what's going on and carrying forward. So everyone must understand the behaviors of concern. We need to uh, take the experience that you've got. Many of you can recognize a student who's at risk and look at those areas. But losing this new tool of understanding what's being said in the, on the internet, in social media, gives you a difference in making uh, a difference within your school. It becomes predictive and actionable intelligence. I would kill her. Mina and I have already made plans, too, like uh, ways to do it. And then if you look at this, let's go for it. That's the type of concern. And if you knew this from this posting, then you don't have to wait until a violent act came up to try to disrupt something that was occurring in your school or to carry forward. In many of the cases, if you intervene early, you can prevent those actions from taking place. Uh, look at a student who hates the school and the people in it and what their intentions are. We have to listen to this information. And once we see that information, then we can go back and specifically look at that student, look at that person of interest. We can go back in time and look at what their postings were yesterday or Tuesday of last week or pick another point in coming together and see those patterns start to develop. 
we can understand what their sphere of influence is, who else are they they're talking about, and we can even do this on a geographic basis. Imagine if that was your school in the little goal block in the center. We can put up the geofence, that's the circle that you see around it, and look at all the postings that are coming in and out of that particular area to pick that information up. Now, listening can be broad and not limited to a geographic tool, but this gives us the ability to look at a particular person and to look at exactly what's happening and where that person is at any given time to better understand it. So it's two areas together. It's the listen and it's the look to tell us what's going on. Now, it's more than just looking at uh, violence and its operational issues. Uh, I described earlier the potential financial impacts of this on your school. But who's listening to what's being said out there? Everyone. And if you're not part of that, then there's knowledge and information about issues that are occurring right now in your school that you're not involved in, that you don't know that it's going to be happening. And there is an expectation because you have care, custody, and control of our young people as they're in your school. This information is out there for your use. It needs to go into a program that you can, how you monitor it, how you bring that information forward, and then what actions do you take when those warning signs are there and coming together. So today I'd like you to think about, do you want to know what will happen tomorrow? Now, if we were investing in the stock market, we certainly would like to know that a stock is going to go up tomorrow or going to go down. It would change our behavior today. If we're concerned about a stock, aren't we more concerned about our children and what's happening with the students in our schools? Can you afford not to know that these things are happening there? And later, if you're explaining how, well, we weren't looking for that, we weren't thinking about that, and as a general rule in all of these circumstances, if you're explaining, you're losing. So learning about it early makes a big difference as you carry forward. So contact Firestorm if you would like to know how to align your plans to best practices or if you want to create your own intelligence network or even schedule some training around the types of issues that we're talking about. I would also remind you that the user conference coming up this summer in July in San Antonio for RenWeb, there will be a series of breakout sessions uh, called Crisis Coach and making decisions in a crisis and going through an actual uh, tabletop exercise and carrying forward and talking about these intelligence networks and showing you what you, you need to do and how you can do that. If you want an assessment of your plans of where you are relative to standards and best practices, that's been underwritten by RenWeb. So there is no cost to you. We can look at your preparedness plans or emergency or crisis or your violence prevention plans within your school or help you in any particular area. And that's because of your uh, use of the RenWeb system and your, their support of you and your school and your students. Our thanks go to them for underwriting the cost of today's webinar and preparing this information there for everyone. Bill, did Jacqueline, was she able to join us today? No, but I noticed that Shannon is on. Oh, okay. Shannon, is she uh, able where she can speak? Yeah, I'm. I'm on. Shannon, do you have any comments or any observations you want to make about today's webinar? Um, no, I think uh, what you all said was a good good summary. Well, thanks. So we appreciate your your comments, and we appreciate everybody taking the time out of a busy school day. I know we're in the spring season and hopefully everyone's spring break is coming uh, here shortly and you'll have some time that, uh, to catch up and take a look. If you've got questions about this area, uh, we're going to try to reach out to every one of the schools that we're on today and answer their questions directly. Uh, so thank you for spending some time with us to talk about creating an intelligence network in your school. Uh, as you uh, go through this experience, there is information that's available to you. And we want to create an environment in every school so that a behavior of concern is recognized. And when it's recognized, that it's reported. And it can be reported anonymously so there's no ramifications back to the student or the teacher who brings that information forward. And then finally, acted upon. And you've got to have a process in place that you approach that behavior of concern 
the same way each and every time because we don't want to have to explain to a parent why their child is unable to come home. Firestorm uh, has done a lot of work in the crisis management area and we've unfortunately had to go in after the events have occurred and we much prefer where we are in our conversations today talking about what you can do to make a difference within your school and identifying those behaviors and interacting. When we identify data and information, there's hard data and soft data. Soft data would be your opinion. You're looking at a behavior of concern and you're evaluating it. Hard data would be a thing like the posting of a picture or the posting of an email or a posting of a tweet on a particular comment. That's hard data. You can see it. It's real. It exists. You know about it. And therefore, it makes that data very actionable if you have a plan to know how to see it and are prepared to utilize that information. You put up a fence around your school to protect unwelcome intrusion into it. You put locks on the outside of your school building so that that problem doesn't come into the school. You probably have a, 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 a monitoring system, a, a security system in your school. You have cameras maybe at your entrances to know who's there. Well, the people that are there are there today on social media. And they're having this conversation. And they're talking about things that where there's intent and that intent matters. You need to be aware of it. You need to know what's occurring. And you then need to be able to intervene before that elevates to a threat, to violence, and even death. If you've got questions, you can contact us at firestorm.com. There's a contact form there. Or you can drop us an email at webinars at firestorm.com. Or pick up the phone and call us at 800-321-2219. Thank you for all that you do every day for our young people and what you're doing to help in each and every one of our schools. We'll have another webinar next month as we continue the series. And I look forward to seeing many of you in uh, San Antonio in July for the event. Have a great day, everyone. We'll give you back your day. Goodbye.